Okay. Um, I guess it's uh, one past now. So it's about time to begin. Um, I'm still Leonard Puttering. I'm going to talk today about um, System DS, the Core OS. Um, the Core OS is, uh, is some relatively new, newly coined terminology. Um, <coughs> It was actually actually coined in an LWN article about um, System D, and uh, we liked the term very much, so we adopted it. And um, this talk um, should uh, highlight a little bit what we actually understand as the core OS, why we think System D is the core OS or should be relevant for the core OS, and all the things around it. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned that yesterday already. I like my talks interactive, so if you have any kind of questions, please interrupt me. Um, I'd much rather prefer if we turn this talk into the direction you guys want rather than just what I like to talk about. So if you have questions, just show up and we can answer them right away. <coughs> okay, so uh, as mentioned, the, the core is terminology, ter terminology um, for LWN. Um, it's a bit of a vision of what uh, system D should be now. When we started with system D, um, we, of course, started with, uh, we wanted it to be an init system. Um, an init system is, uh, is responsible for bringing up the system. That's why it's called an init system. Um, but as we progressed with this uh, vision, um, we figured out that maybe it's not sufficient to just focus on the init system and init system alone. And system D turned into something of uh, basic building, a set of basic building blocks to build an OS from. And for that, we now have this nice term core OS. Um, so what's the reason we, we, we shifted the focus um, a little bit um, from just being an init system to being a uh, core OS? Um, the reason is basically when we um, looked at, uh, at solving the init situation, we figured out that, well, just being PID1 and bringing up the system is not enough because um, Actually, the init system is not the only thing that is um, crucial for bringing up the system. Um, usually, in, in traditional Linux and in Unix, there's a huge number of scripts which initialize certain parts of the um, system um, as well, which are not part of the init system traditionally, but which are shipped along with, with it and are very much distribution specific. These can be various things, for example, like starting UDEF and doing device discovery and loading kernel modules. It could be something like registering new binary formats. It could be um, uh, emptying slash temp. Um, it could be all kinds of, of little things that each by its own are very simple and, and minimal. Um, but uh, um, you all have to have them to have a, a proper um, operating system being built from. The different uh, operate, uh, um, distributions have different had different scripts for that, but they all very much did the same things. They cleaned up slash temp and all the things that I just mentioned and a couple of other things. Um, did it all with different code? Is it all um, different um, quality? Um, but yeah, so we looked at that and, and, and figured out, okay, we have uh, cleaned up the init system, but uh, it really would be interesting to clean up this basic set of init scripts as well and replace complex shell scripts by um, relatively simple and minimal C programs. So, yeah, we, the, we then started to move a couple of things into systemd proper, um, meaning that uh, systemd turned into just being one process in, into a set of processes, a set of very minimal processes that are responsible for very specific parts of, of, of system initialization. And, uh, yeah, bit by bit, this vision extended a little bit, like uh, we moved more and more stuff into it. For example, nowadays we have a replacement for console kit which manages um, sessions. Um, the reason we moved that in is, is very similar because we, we figured out, okay, um, service management is all about resource control and by, by, by about um, setting properties for services like process properties and the C group properties and, and all these kind of things. And we figured out, well, um, services are not the only processes running on a system. On a system, you have all kinds of processes running. Um, for example, also user processes. I mean, if you log into your GNOME session, then that's not a system service, that's user code, basically. And it is very interesting to set all the properties that you can set for service management for the individual services. You can also set for the user services. You, you want that because, because um, I mean, one, one interesting use case, for example, for, for C groups is uh, 
that if you have Apache running in MySQL and Apache has a thousand CGI scripts and MySQL only has um, 20 worker processes or something like that, you still want MySQL and, and, and uh, Apache get roughly the same num uh, amount of CPU. So for that, um, you can use C groups. But the same problem actually also applies to sessions. Yeah, if you wanna, if one user logs in and creates a thousand processes and another user logs in and only gets three, they still should get, in total, each of them is the same amount of uh, CPU. And that's where C group comes in as well. So you figure out, okay, so a lot of things that apply to the service um, problem also apply to the session problem. And so we figured out, okay, um, maybe, if we have that code anyway in system, we should extend that and, and also include something complicated like that manages sessions, tracks when users log in, applies um, um, uh, properties to them, um, wraps them all nicely in C groups, and these kind of things. So, um, yeah, basically the vision grew a little bit by bit. Um, we added stuff here and there everywhere. Um, so, yeah, to, 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 to summarize this vision of what, what uh, system in that case should be, the core OS should be, is a minimal set of components to build an OS from. Um, of course, by with the time, the minimality increased bit by bit. Um, I guess that is, um, I mean, most uh, computing pro uh, programs end up growing and growing and growing that way. Um, so uh, by minimal, we actually don't m really mean the absolute minimum um, you need to, to, to build an operating system from. Like, if you want to do that, then, then there are other solutions like BusyBox and kind of things. And we don't want to have, like, go into that turf. But what we kind of try to focus on is, is um, providing everything that 90% of the use cases require. And 90% of the use cases requires also covering um, all the important bases like desktop stuff, server stuff, and evidence stuff as well. Um, the core OS. Um, having this all in systemd does not mean that systemd should be one monolithic thing that covers everything, but it means simply um, that we have a, have a set of services that are tightly coupled, that integrate nicely, that behave similar, that share code, that reduce um, uh, duplication, but that are still individual processes. So if you install systemd these days, it will cover a lot of ground, but it's about, um, I don't know, 50 or so individual processes. At boot, we start at least, I don't know, 10 or 15 of those. So, um, yeah, it's about, um, it's not about making things monolithic, not about pulling things all in the same process. It's about simply streamlining the code a bit, unifying things, unifying things between distributions, and um, unifying code paths where we all, all have the same stuff. Um, the core OS should be universal. It should call, call, uh, cover all the architectures, and it should call all the users. As mentioned, servers, containers, embedded desktop, all this kind of stuff, we want to cover um, with systemd. We kind of want to focus on the same bandwidth as Linux itself focuses on. And the same way as Linux works on mobile phones, on servers, and embedded on, on desktop, we want systemd to cover the same ground. As mentioned, not everything, like if you want to go really embedded, then go for BusyBox and leave systemd out. But everything that is like um, the more common stuff. Um, Universal does not mean that we want to cover other kernels or anything like that. We strictly want to focus on Linux. Um, with systemd as the, the core OS, we want to manage all the high-level OS objects. Traditionally, on, 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 on Linux kernels, um, like the, the only concept the kernel knew were basically files and directories and these kind of things and processes and a couple of, of other stuff like sockets. We want to add a couple of, or we, we added a couple of high-level things that that are now managed by, by systemd. Um, of course, services. Services we actually define in, in terms of C groups mostly, so that nowadays you have the, 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 this identity of a service actually exposed as kernel objects by means of C groups. And we did the same for user sessions, for containers and apps, where everything basically now exists in all layers of the stack on the kernel level as means by C groups and in user space by, by user maintained, uh, user space maintained objects. Um, so yeah, that's our vision a little bit, like like basically finishing the, the, the high-level object view on the system where, where basically POSIX left off and didn't go any further. And it's, it's basically just realizing the fact that, I mean, traditionally on Unix, probably most services were just a single process each. Um, but nowadays, that's not really how systems work, and they haven't been for a long time, because Apache is hardly one process. It's a set of processes. One process, a couple of worker processes, a couple of CGI scripts, and these kind of things. So yeah, this vision of the core OS, um, we try to 
basically complete this thing and have the same definitions that we have on, on all layers of our stacks of these high level copies. Um, system DSC Quad OS, um, one of the key aspects we try to focus on is introspectability. Introspectability means um, um, whatever state the system is in currently, you want to allow the administrator, the user, the developer be, um, be able to, to, to look into it. Um, more specifically, that meant in the system cases, um, most of the components we have, um, you can connect to primarily via DBus or other, um, like individual components have different um, uses there. But um, we basically give the administrator and developers and the complete access to the internals of system D. Um, mostly readable access, but sometimes even you can control it. Um, transparency means um, also that you can look into all the details. <coughs> Specifically, this can mean, for example, profiling is built in the system B. Um, because we, we, we figured out um, a lot of things that, that, that yeah, just ha know how long um, your system booted up. It's, it's very useful information. Um, and we generate this nowadays with, with system B built in. So, so um, um, from system B built in. So that when you boot up, it will just measure everything. It will can, can tell you how much time the BIOS took, how much time the bootloader took, how much time the kernel took to initialize, how much time the initial RAM was cooked to, to um, initialize and how much actual the final user space bit took. So um, yeah, we, we, we want to focus on, on making everything introspectable so that you always can figure out what's going on, how long did it take, uh, what was involved, in which order it was it executed, these kind of things. Um, yeah, the, as mentioned, I mentioned a couple of times actually, um, system as a core OS is supposed to be something you build real world systems from. So it's not the absolute minimum that boots. It's, it's, it's more than that. Um, this, of course, is, is like <coughs> if, we, if we decide if, if something belongs in the core OS, hence it belongs to system D, we, of course, always have this question like, um, yeah, where do we put the limit? Well, there's going to be more about that later on. But um, yeah, we, we knowingly put the limit not at the maximum, at the absolute mi minimum, which uh, some people probably would do. Um, and then we want to make sure that, that whatever you put into system D um, should be zero maintenance. Um, by that we mean that whatever happens in whatever condition you run this stuff, it should not fuck up. Um, more specifically, like to let, let me give you an example of what we mean by that. Um, if we look at things like syslog, for example. In syslog, um, traditionally, if uh, log files were, were, were collected and written to disk, um, rotation would come by time. After a while, rotate the files and um, free a little bit of disk space and uh, um, delete old files, basically. And uh, then um, rotation is finished, and then after an hour, it would come back and do the same thing. Um, now, this kind of design, like from the first look at it, kind of looks safe because um, after some time, the disk always gets cleaned up. And if the disk runs full, then you just have to wait an hour and everything's done. But, but um, if you actually look closely at it, it is, it's fundamentally flawed in a way. Because if somebody manages to, to generate a lot of log messages in a very short time period, he kind of can DOS the system. And until the next time the lo log rotation actually takes place, um, the system will be basically clocked. Nothing can write to disk anymore because um, the disk is full. So um, in the systemd context, we added, we added a little bit of logging um, functionality into it. We really wanted to avoid these kind of, of, of vulnerabilities. And what we did basically is that um, in, the, in the journal context, in the system the logging framework context. Everything we log to disk, we first check if we can actually do that if the disk is um, too full and stuff like that. And hence do the, the rotation in line um, synchronously to, to how we write stuff. So yeah, and then this, this thing is just kind of goes like this. It's kind of thinking of, of, of designing a system that whatever happens, we stay running and we, we don't um, knowingly enter a condition where it doesn't work anymore. Um, goes through the entire design. I mean, this, this, this also means a lot of other things. For example, we put a strong focus on uh, um, allowing the administrator and developers configure their services in a way that they automatically restarted if something failed. Um, this is something actually that was solely missing in, in System 5 init. Because in System 5 init, when you start a service, um, that's basically all that happens, and <coughs> nobody watches if the service ever dies. Nobody is there, nothing is there that could restart the service when the service dies and make sure it goes up again. Which is, which is actually huge. I mean, there's, there's, there's a huge hole in the entire model of, of Linux traditionally. 
Um, because I mean, how can you do like like a reliable um, if servers if, if if something fucks up and you cannot automatically recover from that? Um, but this also means a couple of other things, like um, um, in systemd, for example, we have socket activation, which which allows a lot a lot of interesting things because we kind of can can recover from from them dying without actually losing the connectivity because the socket part of like the, the actual communication part of the demons always stays around and is maintained by the unit system. And if the actual processing part dies, then of course the specific uh, transaction it currently was working on will will um, fail and, and will uh, be terminated. But uh, the actual connectivity is never lost. So yeah, the the entire process of, of, of design that we had in there was always to keep in mind whatever we do, we want to have it in a way that it is reliable, that it gives um, either is automatically reliable um, by the way it's designed, or at least gives the administrator and, and developer the the means to make it reliable by doing automatic restarting. <coughs> um, this one, the minimized test matrix, is, is an absolutely key thing for us. Um, minimized test matrix, um, by that we basically mean we want to remove a lot of variables from the base system. Um, the minimized test matrix basically means like if you look at the distribution like Debian, where they have of every component 10 implementations. If you want to test everything with everything, then the te test matrix becomes huge because, uh, yeah, it, it, you have to, 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 to test every combination against every combination. And the more combinations you have, the, huge, the, the larger the test matrix goes. And uh, effectively, this means is like the more variables you have in the system, um, the, the more unlikely is, is yeah, that you will actually find the bugs in every possible combination. So we want to minimize the test matrix with uh, the stuff that we do in this. So basically, we want to remove variables that make no sense anymore. Um, this, in, in, this has various effects. Like for example, traditionally on Linux, there's this really simple program called Getty. Getty is, is um, responsible for, for bringing a prompt on a, on a terminal screen so that you can type in your username and password and will lock you in. It's an absolutely trivial thing. It will just really just ask for a username and password, um, then, then check TAM, like the security the authentication library, and if it's okay, it will spawn a shell for you. There's nothing, like, there are a few programs in our stack that are trivial, more trivial than that. Um, now, as it turned out, over the history of Linux, we got, like, seven implementations of that. Um, the core distributions ended up shipping at least three of them. A-Getty, Min-Getty, and something called just Getty. All these programs were completely trivial and uh, could all do the same, uh, more or less, functionality. We looked at that and figured out this is bullshit. All distributions pick a different one by default, and all distributions um, ship them all. We shouldn't do that. And then there was all this irony that, <coughs> that somebody created this min Getty thing, which was supposed to be the minimal Getty, which had a smaller binary size but actually took more memory um, than the other Getty that everybody else used. Anyway, so um, we said we're not interested in, in testing all these combinations. We, we don't want this, this kind of unnecessary. Um, uh, variables in there, and we just said, yeah, in system E, we will default to only one of them, to a Getty from your Linux, which is the best maintained and one of the most featureful. Um, and that's how we ship our stuff, and that's how um, everything will work by default. But we will still make it possible that if people want to do something else, they can plug it in. But they have to do manual configuration for that. Um, and yeah, this, this minimized test matrix goes through our entire design as well. <coughs> We try to, to look at the, at the different components of our stack and really ask ourselves if we want the variability in there, if we want the, to have the, the this, um, ability for people to replace the components un unnecessarily. In some cases, it totally makes sense. For example, um, if people want to run Apache or Nginx or whatever kind of HTTP server, it's totally fine. They should all be supported. It's just like, on yeah, in the Getty case, I don't think there's any point in, in making that. Uh, overly configurable and suggesting that people can do that. Um, the effect of that is basically that if you if you run system D system, um, because all the components like kind of like we we suggest you default configuration doesn't mean you have to use that. But yeah, this default configuration because probably most people use that is the best tested um, uh, across the board. And if it's best tested, it might mean it's much likely to be actually robust. <coughs> Another thing you wanted to really make sure about um, about systemd is to, and then in, as usual in the core OS, is design the whole stuff in a way um, that it is useful for read-only system images, 
which is interesting for a lot of um, different use cases. It's interesting for embedded case because, um, yeah, if you have the entire operating system in a way that it's entirely read-only, um, then uh, you're less likely to, to, to run into problems if you suddenly power off the machine. Um, but this also is, is very interesting for containers and things like that because if you, if you are in a container, um, in a containerized environment like cloud and stuff, you usually have 500 containers um, and they have very similar boot images if they don't have the same, exactly the same images. And if you can make them read-only, then you can be sure that, that, yeah, you can basically run all the containers from the same image. And um, if one container changes the image, that's just not possible because um, it's read-only. So um, with system, we really tried hard to separate the read-only parts from the operating system um, from the actual state parts of the operating system so um, that these kind of use cases work. Um, ultimately, our goal with that is even... Um, it's probably not realistic to, to ever achieve that for, for normal systems, but it's very realistic to, to achieve that for embedded and container setup, is that we actually want to be able to ship an empty slash etc, so that the definition of slash etc is not, not anymore to, to ship defaults and these kind of things. I mean, it could still do that, but it, it wouldn't need that. So all the components and systems that, um, that we wrote, basically, uh, they have defaults built in, and if etc is empty, it will still boot up with all these defaults and will just work and will not require any configuration. But if you drop something in a slash etc, that is basically when the administrator um, um, changed the defaults and, and, and overrode what the defaults were. So um, the basic idea is, it's a little bit inspired to ha um, from, from what Android does in this area. Like if you have an Android phone, they still, they, they basically have three, three parts of the, of the um, slash. Um, there's three petitions. <coughs> one is for, the, is for the system image, one is for, for actual user data, like, like your music files and photos and things like that, and one is configuration image. And um, with this model of, of allowing um, empty slash EDC and, and allowing read only slash user, we kind of come close to the Android model. And as mentioned, this is super interesting for, for more embedded kind of things and super interesting for con con container kind of things. But uh, probably not necessarily in the overall design of uh, really uh, the desktop system. So. Um, another thing that we want to go for is statelessness. Um, it took us a while to realize how awesome statelessness actually is. Um, statelessness basically means that if you boot up a system, um, it doesn't require to save any state to work. Um, let, me, let me explain this a little bit. Like, um, I don't know, most people of you probably used Windows before. If you, if you have a Windows operating system image and you boot it on, uh, up on one machine, it will write a ton of registry entries because it will just say, okay, I found this hardware. Let's say something to disk about that. And if you use the same OS image and boot it up on another system with slightly different hardware, then suddenly there will be a ton of more registry things and everything just goes really bad. With everything we want to design for, uh, or have designed so far with systemd in the, as the core OS, we really made sure that the entire thing is stateless. Meaning, um, yeah, I can have the same image and I can boot it up in a container, and I can boot it up on this bare metal machine on the server, and I can boot up on, a, on this um, a bare metal desktop or something like that, and it will work, and it will not save anything to disk, so that, that yeah, it, it's completely stateless. The same image can be used in any possible way. And we actually really, like, especially this, the, this um, being able to boot the same image on bare metal on, on, on a virtualiza virtualizing solution on the container, it's actually really, really interesting. Because with, with the systemd um, image nowadays, you can, you can basically start your server with as bare metal and then move it into a container, and at least all the systemd components will automatically adapt to that and do the right thing. So yeah, statelessness um, is something we, we really find interesting. Then <coughs> here's another thing we tried to do with the core OS model of systemd. We tried to um, basically um, um, copy a little bit um, how the BSD model works. And the, the BSDs are, I mean, I presume most of you know that is a Unix implementation, the classic one. It predates Linux a bit, and it's um, kind of lost um, traction. It's not popular as Linux these days. But uh, their model of, de of uh, um, development is, is, is different from, from how Linux does that. In Linux, um, like the kernel is developed by one group, and uh, the Lipsy is um, developed by another group, and Utilinux by somebody else, and system by somebody else, blah, 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 blah. So you usually have, a, you, you pick um, a lot of different components from a lot of different people, and um, then you build a system from that, and you take different versions, and you mix and match, and you basically have this bazaar of components that you put together in, in, in a way that you want it. The BSD model is different. The BSD model, everything's basically developed um, 
in a single repository, more or less. So the libc is updated at the same time as the kernel is, is and, and the user space components are all in the same tree. We kind of wanted to, to, to not go all the way to the BSD model, but at least um, move things a little bit closer. So basically, effectively this means that, yeah, we moved a lot of, of the basic building blocks of an operating system into the systemd tree, um, like UDIF and these kind of things, for example, and develop them in line so that we that the integration can be um, synchronized and we don't have to, to maintain all the uh, um, different um, compatibility for all the different versions all the time. This helps us reduce the test metrics. This helps us to move a little bit faster because instead of um, updating 20 packages or 100 packages or so, you can just update one. This does not mean that, uh, yeah, you can build the entire operating system just with one package, but it will reduce the set of uh, uh, packages you need to build the operating system. So, um, I mean, traditionally, if you want to build a, a Linux operating system, you kind of need, need 60 packages or so. You need libc, you need the kernel, you need you to Linux, you need agati, you get, uh, and these con kind of things. With, by adopting this little bit, going a model that goes a little bit into the BSD direction in system me, um, we hopefully kind of reduce that to, to just requiring 20 or so. <coughs> Another thing is, um, yeah, we try to innovate a little bit within the Unix design. It's actually, I mean, there are a lot of people who think Unix, oh my god, Unix is awesome, and systemd is totally not Unix, and so is Unix, uh, and so systemd sucks, and these kind of things. Actually, we as a system guys do believe that, that Unix is great inspiration. It's, um, it's, uh, um, created something durable, and we should always drive inspiration from that. And we actually believe that in system we also do that. More specifically, <coughs> this basically means, uh, um, yeah, we try to, to um, I mean, in insisting there are a lot of components that kind of replacing uh, specific components that um, people traditionally understood as Unix. Like, for example, we have, like, the journal, which kind of replaces the log, but not really replaces it. But um, the thing is, w and we, sh we believe that, that Unix is mostly about the concept that they used. Um, more specifically, in Unix, everything was a file. In, in systemd, we said, okay, um, if everything's a, a, a file, then we can go one step further and actually say that services are a file too. So in, in the systemd world, due to using C groups to group processes, and C groups being exposed in the file system, um, we can actually say, okay, yeah, we went one step further to be more Unix-ish. Because, uh, yeah, in the file system, you suddenly see all the services and not just processes less and slash prox. But that's just one example. There are many other examples. Like, for example, in, in Unix, traditionally, you had this uh, TTY logic. TTY is teletype. It's basically, on, on tradi traditional Unix system, you had basically one central, you could have um, one central server and a couple of uh, terminals connected to it. And each terminal was basically just a keyboard plus a screen. And, um, yeah, this is, this is how, how machines worked um, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, but not anymore really these days. But um, the concept is actually kind of cool because you have just a single machine that you have to administrate, to administrate and it's cheaper and it's more and more energy efficient and easier to administrate, but you have a couple of users on the same thing. With system, we said, okay, it's a cool thing, but we probably need to, to, to bring the concept um, to what is today required from a workstation because just a keyboard and a screen is not anymore what, what people expect from a workstation. Nowadays, they expect that sound works, that there's a mouse, that it is graphical, that um, um, there might be even a webcam, and there might be something where you can plug in your USB key, your, your, your storage device, and it will actually show up on your seat and not of your neighbor's uh, seat. So, um, yeah, we looked at that and thought, okay, we can make that happen again. We can bring this bit of Unix history back, update it to how systems work these days, and we did that by, by multi-seat support and system. Multi-seat support basically just means that, that um, yeah, we, 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 due to creating these concepts that I mentioned earlier of sessions and seats and, and users, uh, these high-level operating system concepts, we just said, okay, yeah, then let's right away from the beginning introduce multi-seat support. That basically means that um, system is actually capable of tracking which device belongs to which seat. And, um, yeah, if you log in on a, on a system, the system will always um, keep in mind, okay, you logged in on that seat and hence you have access to this um, set of hardware. And if you log out and somebody else can log in, then hardware is assigned to that user, depending on which seat you log in. So yeah, that's another thing where we kind of looked at back at what, what Unix actually was about and, and, and then said, okay, that's cool. Let's bring that back. It kind of was lost in history, but it was a good idea. So yeah, and a couple of other things where we basically just said, okay, this is totally Unix. Um, again, I'm pretty sure a lot of people totally disagree with that, say, system is not, not 
not Unix at all. Um, yeah. Um, another thing that we try to follow with, with systemd as the core OS is that we really should take what Linux offers and provide the user with it. Um, <coughs> and empower the user with it. That basically means um, in, 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 in Linux, um, since, since time began, basically, people cared a lot about portability. So they wanted not to limit themselves to one specific operating system or Linux, but they were kind of focused on, on, on APIs such as POSIX and developing the APIs um, against POSIX and, and little else so that it would run on the BSDs and Solaris and all these kind of things at the same time. Um, this is an interesting concept, and it, it works quite well the higher up you go in the stack. But um, with systemly being like, yeah, basically the building block for the OS, which is way further down, we saw that's not probably not the best concept to follow. Since the Linux kernel actually offers so much more beyond POSIX that is really useful to have. Um, for example, I mean, it starts for C groups like resource management. Um, running services these days is mostly like, like one of the primary facets of, of, of service management is resource management. Like if you have, regardless if you have an Amity device or you have a huge server, um, if you have an Amity device, you probably want to run like 10 services on, a, on them and you have very little resources and you want to uh, really distribute the resources you have in, a, in the way you want across the um, uh, several services you have, and hence um, resource management really matters. If you have a huge server, um, you have a lot of resources, but you probably run even more services on them because you have a lot of um, customers you sold virtual machines to, for example. And if you have 500 machines there, um, you probably want to want to use your machine to a very high degree because you made investment in the machine and buying it, and hence the more customers you can s um, sell it to at the same time, uh, the more money you will make. So um, whatever side you look at, uh, um, resource management is absolutely key for, for running uh, modern uh, computers. So, but resource management in, in classic POSIX is really minimal. Like they have they have resource limits. They're called their per process, but that makes them kind of useless because not even a web server like on a web server that doesn't even make sense anymore because a web server usually has a lot of worker threads and CGI scripts and things like that. And setting a per process limit hence has very little effect because people can just fork off and, and they get a new set of limits. So. Um, yeah, we, we decided, as we, we looked at the Linux kernel and found so many awesome things in there that make real life, um, like, like administrator lives and, and, and um, so much more useful that we say, we will not limit ourselves to POSIX. We will actually expose what the, what the kernel has to offer at awesome things, awesome technology. And that, that uh, covers everything, like resource management, as I just said, a lot of security things that the kernel exposes, um, hardware management, all these kind of things. We really want to give the user the full power of the system and expose it um, as if it was normal and not add this, this artificial limitation of, of just being stuck to POSIX. Um, another thing that we try to do with system um, as the core OS is um, if we run into a problem, we always want to fix that problem instead of working around it. That basically meant <coughs> um, that if, if something we need in the kernel, then we will fix it in the kernel uh, rather than work around. This is traditionally like probably um, done differently when people build inner systems. I mean, if you, if you, if you look into the, the, the inner scripts of, of or the, the, the initial scripts of, of the various distributions, you find tons and tons of sleep loops where, where they wait for something to happen and they sleep for one second and check if it happened now and then if it didn't, they sleep again. And all these kind of things are just gross hacks. And we, we, we basically, when we sat down and, 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 and started with system, we said, we'll never do that. Um, we will really try hard to always fix the problem where it is and fix it properly instead of um, adding adding uh, um, a workaround for it. Another um, design goal with systemd as a core OS is that we never want to be exclusive. That means um, while we will replace a lot of functionality that has been traditionally um, implemented in the various Unix services, um, we never want to force people to actually use that. People can continue to use what they what they want. For example, more specifically, this means in systemd you can run services based on time. You can say, uh, run this service every five minutes or so, or run this service um, on November 5th, 2013, at 6 a.m. in the morning. Um, this, of course, is functionality that, that had been existing before in cron. And people love cron, and cron is awesome because it's really simple to use. You just write one line and can just um, define that. So um, when we added that to systemd, we saw it's really useful to have that in systemd because uh, systemd is really good at, at, at starting services. You can um, specify all the resource limits, all these other 
um, um, properties that the Linux kernel exposes for you. It can restart things, it can watch stuff, it can, can, can collect the logs of the service, which is much better than what Crony can do. But we acknowledge that people love Crony and, and people are across any kind of Crony implementation. So yeah, we never are exclusive. We um, allow people to run whatever they want, um, even if we provide something um, similar or equally powerful or somewhat related in the, in the basic operating system. So um, this is like this. Our, our everything that it was talking about is just this fluff design thing that, that we kept in mind while turning system D from this init system into this um, core OS kind of thing. Um, the next part of the slide basically focuses on the, on the specific parts where we kind of um, took one of the, the existing components and uh, replaced them in, in the system itself. And uh, I hopefully can explain why we did this in the specific case. So uh, the obvious case, of course, um, system replaced replaces system five init. Then uh, most distribution had something called start stop daemon, which they, um, because actually spawning services from shell scripts sucked, they, they wrote a little bit of a glue thing in between called stop stop daemon, which makes a starting service a little bit nicer. Um, it's all gone. In its scripts, as mentioned, this, um, like all the distributions had a different implementation of that. It's just a set of basic um, in its scripts that everybody used to set up to load modules, blah, 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 blah. And we replaced that. These are kind of the obvious things because it's, yeah, it's what system we started at, out as. We kind of replaced INID. INID is this thing. Many modern machines don't even have that anymore, but um, if you have been in, around in Unix for longer, you do know this thing. It's basically, it allows you to run services um, only when somebody actually connects to them. Meaning, um, I don't know, if you, if you have, a <coughs> if you run git, for example, the git daemon, um, there's no need to run it all the time. It's, it's efficient if you actually um, run the git daemon somebody connects to it and wants to check out your sources or something like that. So traditionally people used INID for that. It would just listen on a port or on a list of, of, of um, uh, ports and IP addresses. And then as soon as somebody connected would actually start the service, the actual git demo. Um, this, this existed in Unix since, since the 70s basically. And it's, it's a, it, it was used as a way to, to kind of overcommit the, the functionality of the machine. So you have a very, very low resource machine and you can run a ton of services on them because the services are only started when they're actually needed. Um, in systemd, we have something called socket activation, which makes use of this, but it's a lot more powerful than classic INID. Um, but it's also compatible to INID. So whatever, if you have an INID service like git daemon or what, whatever you have, it will actually work with systemd as well. And as systemd can do a lot of other things, um, uh, like uh, you can, can have support for more protocols than just INID, uh, internet sockets can do that on Unix sockets, those kind of things. Um, and you can say ton loads, a set of ton loads of parameters for the, for the sockets, like, like I don't know, um, TOS fields and, and these kind of things. Um, it is a lot more useful. Then we kind of replaced cron on apps. Um, uh, cron being, I just talked about cron uh, uh, um, before, and app doing something very similar. Um, actually, just, just two weeks ago, something I actually implemented the calendar time support for, for <coughs> uh, time activation. So yeah, um, if you if you have an app added system and don't actually need the functionality that actually real cron provides to you, nor the interface with cron, then this should absolutely be sufficient. Like if you want to start um, jobs based on time, system you will do that out of the box. Another thing that we replaced is reader hat. Reader hat is something that's not so interesting on, on, on servers, but it is kind of relevant on desktops and on embedded hub or some embedded setup. It's basically something um, that optimizes boot speeds. Um, it, it basically, uh, it, it, it starts during boot up and uh, um, watches um, what uh, part of the hard disk is actually accessed during boot. And then in the next boot, it uses that data it collected and uh, will load all this data into memory uh, very quickly at boot, um, like, like very early. And then if the, the boot process actually needs that data, it's already in memory. So it's a, it, it gives you like, depending on, on what kind of hardware we have, it gives you like 20% speed up at boot up. And we said, um, we, we looked at that and there were like, there are probably like five different implementations of it and they all sucked in different ways um, and, and really hard in, in different ways. Like for example, some of them used the audit uh, framework, which is something for security to watch this, <laughs> the file this uh, uh, um, system accesses, which kind of broke audit if you enable this functionality, it's crazy. And other um, things used, yeah. It's, it was all, all, all awful and we, we, we looked at that and said, okay, Reader Hat is actually something useful to have 
um, because even on modern hardware, if you have SSDs and things like that, it actually speeds up your boot. And there's a sufficient um, large number of people who actually will use this, like amateur people and, and investor people. Um, so we said, okay, we'll move, we'll move an implementation of that into systemd. It's nicely integrated. It's, it started at the right time in boot very, very early on and uh, collects this data and will just work. Of course, um, this functionality um, is completely optional, like because on the server you don't need that. Um, you can just compile time without, like at, at, remove it at compile time or remove it at runtime. It's completely up to you. I already mentioned this. Um, we replace constantly, like um, session tracking, user set, uh, tracking, um, seat tracking. This is all done by some component called LogMD in systemd. It's also an optional uh, component because if you have an Amateur device where no user ever can log into, because I don't know uh, how would you log into your refrigerator, um, you can remove that part. But we said it's it's common enough, um, it should be in systemd, so the people who need it um, can just use that and it's nicely integrated, will work and, and uh, interface with all the rest of it. <coughs> then uh, um, earlier this year we introduced something called um, Journal, which um, can uh, replace his login away. Uh, talking about the journal is probably could be another talk, entire hour, hours I could talk about that. So I'm not going to cover too much about that. Um, but yeah, you basically um, we s we we looked at syslog, figured out there are huge problems in, in uh, current syslog because it, I mean it basically was designed from 1983 or something and hadn't changed at all in its functionality. It doesn't do anything what what people probably want these days. And so we came up with a journal which which um, can take the same input as syslog, including it's combat compatible to a certain degree with this log, but it provides you a lot of different functionality, much more powerful. Um, so we added that to, to the journal because we um, inherently believe that, that collecting logs of services is absolutely essential about service management, and systemd primarily is, 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 is about service management. Um, basically this, uh, I mean more specifically this means if we watch services dying and can we start them, then this is this is only half of the of the e equation because I mean if you restart a service you need to give the administrator uh, a, a way to to for him to figure out why it died and so that he can do something about it for the next time and and this why question you can only answer with the logs so we came to this conclusion that there's no way around it collecting logs and handling logs and indexing logs is absolutely essential for service management it's just one facet of it and 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 keeping this entirely separate doesn't scale because, I mean, classic syslog is not indexed and it's not trustable and all these kind of things. So we, that's, that's why we moved that into this layer. Of course, um, moving this, as mentioned, um, we are never exclusive so people can continue to run syslog. But yeah, here's a simple one we added, watchdog support. Um, hardware watchdog is a really stupid thing. But basically, it's, it's something that high availability servers and, and things like that use, it's, and, and embedded devices use. Um, it's basically, it's a small device. Even my laptop, even this netbook that I'm using there has a hardware uh, watchbox device these days. It's a very simple device that if the software doesn't ping it um, in, uh, frequently enough, like every, like it's configurable the, the time, but let's say every minute, then um, the hardware will be automatically reset and rebooted. So the idea is that, yeah, if for some reason software hangs, um, the machine gets automatically rebooted and, and becomes usable again. Um, yeah. The user space part, or like the, the, the software part of, of watchdog support is absolutely trivial. All you need to do is wake up every now and then and send one IOTL to the device. And we figured out, okay, watchdog support, um, in a way, is absolutely essential to many, many use cases, like um, servers and embedded and all these kind of things, not on the desktop. But uh, so we said, okay, writing, executing one IOTL is probably something we should be moving into systemd, especially since we recursively actually need to support watchdog support to services as well. Meaning um, that if, if, for example, Apache stops responding, we probably should restart Apache as well, not just when Apache is dying. And if you if you do that for the individual services, um, so that systemd supervises the services and does watchdog for them, then you probably need something that also watchdog systemd, and we can use the hardware for that. So uh, yeah, we said, okay, um, we can just move this watchdog support into systemd, and it's trivial, it's like five lines of code, and um, yeah, we'll cover a lot of um, um, use cases, and it's much nicer and great. Um, yeah, ACP ID. ACP ID is a, is a, is a, is a program that <laughs> whose only purpose is that, that when you press the power button on your desktop or on your server, the machine shuts down. And if you, yeah, and if you press the sleep button, it's the same. That's the only purpose of ACP ID. And that's an absolute trivial thing to do. Absolutely trivial. If a key press comes in, you shut down the machine. There's nothing about it. 
Traditionally, though, um, people always had to install SPID, like a daemon, for this app material thing. And now this thing is, um, the init system already c um, controls, like if, if somebody press control alt del, it reboots on its own. And that's already handled for, for, by, by the init system anyway. So the question is, why do we actually need an individual daemon to, to, to react to power presses if we already have one that's way more complicated for reboots inside the PID one? So then we said, okay, this is ridiculous. Uh, everybody needs, needs uh, the handling of the power key. Um, so we moved that uh, one layer down. So my time is over, basically. Um, we moved up to a couple of other things, like power management stuff. It's, it's now in systemd. Parts of AutoFS. Um, UDEF has moved into systemd. Um, handling of crypto devices um, and a couple of things. And we innovated a couple of things. And uh, yeah, we have a couple of other things on, on the line. But um, that's, this is the basic last thing I want to talk about. Where to draw the line? If, he, if people look at this, then of course we moved a lot of things into systemd, and the question is, well, that's a lot of things in there. Isn't systemd uh, bloated? And uh, because, I mean, it, you, previously we had so many different components that diff did different things, and uh, now we moved all thing into one, and then this one thing grew large, and so it's bloated. I think that's a complete bullshit um, um, thing to say about systemd, because um, I'm pretty sure that, that systemd actually works against bloat. Because it doesn't actually move anything into the, uh, everything into one single process, but it just um, changes the distribution model how we do these things. Like instead of uh, having 20 or so, um, uh, or 100 or so different packages, it just moves um, a lot of them into one package. And it removes a lot of duplication of code. Like if you could look at, for example, cron, and look at init and look at classic system 5 init and start stop them, and you realize that most of the, the stuff they do is actually just spawning processes. And all of them have different functionality in that. Like some of them can set environment variables before setting the um, starting something, and some of them can do some other properties when starting them. But uh, yeah, with system, we said, okay, system, you should be really good at setting the environment up for services to run. And we want to, regardless how it's triggered, um, and provide the same powerful functionality regarding resource control, security, and all these kind of things. Um, so we said, yeah, let's unify all this. Let's just teach system D to, to, to um, have a couple of different triggers to start a service and uh, um, remove all the duplica duplicate code that spawns services um, with various um, amounts of configuration. So, um, yeah, basically, if somebody <coughs> asked me if system D is loaded, I would tell, hell no. It removes duplication. It uh, allows you to, to build your system for much fewer packages. And, uh, yeah. So, um, I don't know. It's just, of course, uh, different people have, have uh, different ideas where to draw the line. Um, we still think that we haven't reached the line yet where we should stop moving things into systemd. But uh, as we started out with just saying systemd should be an in system and nothing else, and nowadays um, changed a little bit positions and saying it's a core OS, um, I guess it's a little bit of a dynamic thing. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting question to figure out where, where, where does to do, draw the line. But anyway, this is all I have for now. Um, um, nobody asked a question so far. Please do that now. There's a, do we have a mic so that this works? No. Or should I just repeat the question? <coughs> I think that. Uh, the first question I want to uh, ask is about the adoption. Like, who is using this? Which distro is using this? I used this on Arch Linux for quite some time. It was what? Uh, I used systemd on RS Linux for quite some time. It's like, which OS is using it now? Which OS will move on to this? So, so what is the future? Um, so basically, um, all distributions have it. Um, all the big commercial distributions use it by default, like meaning um, um, Fedora uses it, uh, SUSE uses it, then RHEL 7 will use it, um, Magai uses it, Mandriva uses it, um, Frugalware uses this, um, Arch Linux uses it by default. Um, Debian and Gentoo have it in, distribution, in the distributions, but don't use it by default. I mean, they're kind of very conservative distributions and move very slowly, especially Debian does. So um, it would be surprised if they already switched. Basically, the big one outlier is Ubuntu. Um, they, they're stuck to Upstart, which is their own thing. Um, and they maintain that and they write that, and I, I do not expect them to switch anytime soon. So, and then, then there's, of course, all the weirdo um, distributions like Slackware, and they're never going to switch, but um, yeah, I don't know. Um, but anyway, basically, the, all the big commercial distributions did, and all the community distribu distributions at least have it. Yeah, 
you started developing this uh, the replacement for init right then you made choices between things like min getty a getty or the things and if you like any one of those you adopted them or you just replaced like the thing which you did with acpid so this is applicable to the desktop environments like you're going to choose one of them so or you're going to no. develop your own i mean to to clarify that um we didn't even make the choice regarding ACPID ID. You still can run ICPID ID and turn off this power button handling in, in systemd. So we will not make things impossible. This is what I meant with this exclusive, exclusive uh, exclusivity thing. That um, even though we provide this functionality in systemd, we will always allow you to continue to run um, what you previously did. We will just have this nice suggestion by the way you can just use the built-in stuff. It's much easier. Um, and it will just work out of the box. But you can still run any kind of, you can run MinGetty if you want it. We will not stop you from that. Um, that's there. I mean, there's even documentation on the internet somewhere where, where people um, figure it out we, how it works. And um, for the desktops, of course, it does, has no implication at all. Like if you use KDE or GNOME or something like that, it's completely irrelevant. This is all low-level stuff. So um, yeah, we, we do not make decisions for you. We basically just say, we make suggestions to you. We say, if you use that one, we have tested it very well, and, and we support it very well, and if you have questions about it, we can ask, answer them right away. Um, but so basically, we don't remove the variables entirely. We just um, say, um, yeah, this is the, the, the option we, we think is the best one. But we don't want to force anybody to, uh, to do anything. <laughs> Well, I, I listened to your talk and I was I couldn't help but wonder uh, most of these uh, philosophies yet you talked about, some of them are slightly conflicting, right? So you, I was wondering about the future of the project. I mean, this project needs a really good BDFL or some way to measure when to draw the line or when not to draw the line. I mean, can you discuss the future of this project? So um, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the question is always where to draw the line and then um, our as approach to that is basically to decide on the individual case. So um, I don't know what the future will bring. And there, there's, there's certain things that we believe is absolutely essential to the basic building blocks of the operating system, where we say, OK, obviously, this belongs to system B. There's some case um, where it's obviously not. For example, being UI or anything like that is definitely not on the, on the card. And there's a lot of things that are in the middle, and we will um, decide in the individual case. But um, to keep this in mind, in systemd, <coughs> even though it gained a lot of modules, um, almost all of those modules are actually optional. There are very few that actually are required. Like, um, the, the only thing that's required is, is basically P81. You have to build that. And you have to build um, UDEV, but you don't even have to run UDEV. And you have to build the journal. And that's basically it. But all the other components, like the replacements for the init scripts, most of them you can totally disable. And at support, you can just do that at configure time. So even though we have a lot of things in, the, in this, in this um, build tree and you build, if you do not specify anything, we build all of it, um, it doesn't mean that you have to, to use that. We just say, well, this is really nicely integrated in our stuff and shares a lot of code, so it moves a lot of uh, complexity and a lot, a lot of duplication. But again, if you, it's totally up to you to use that. And in embedded cases, for example, I expect people to turn off a lot of it. And um, yeah, anyway, so, so whatever we add, um, it's very likely that, that things are going to stay optional. Um, so um, yeah, we, we will have to figure that out in individual cases. But um, the thing is like, yeah, the systems change a little bit um, how they used to be and how they are nowadays. But um, basically everything that's, that's probably <coughs> the vast majority of people will need to build an operating system might, um, like, and it is lower level, low level enough, it probably belongs to systems and all that. But again, individual cases. Yeah, hi. Uh, so looking at your vision of, I'm here. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, I was looking at your vision of uh, integrating some of the utilities that run in uh, in a distribution. And uh, my question is, uh, how do you see this affects, uh, say, uh, updates and other things that from the point of distribution? So today, for example, if cron has a bug and uh, Getting out a new version of a patch version of cron takes is quite fast uh, But when you are moving into a monolithic app, which does a lot of stuff. It's not monolithic uh, Okay, I mean even if it's modular it so for example if you integrated cron functionality into system D uh, And a bug comes up in cron does it require a new version of system D to be released for the maintainers of a distribution to pick up or um. 
I mean, if there's a bug to fix, then there's a bug to fix, and it really depends on the distribution how they package systemd even. Like, for example, if they, if they are concerned by that, they could split up systemd in a lot of individual packages, um, and then they could individually update them. But um, honestly, I mean, looking at the bug history so far, um, I mean, we, we don't have that many bugs, and currently, at least in Fedora, um, it's completely sufficient to do one update every two months or so of the release distributions, or even more seldom than that. So, um, I mean, um, it, it really depends. So far, there's not been a problem at all with that, and, and, um, and the bugs that were there usually were not the super critical ones. So I have a fairly positive uh, view on all of this. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if, if the thing is, like systemd, like the systemd RPM is not huge. It's 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 a couple of megabytes, um, but it. Like, it doesn't really matter if you update all of systemd, you just... But does it cover all the services that you mentioned right now? I haven't actually looked at uh, the systemd in Fedora yet. Does it handle cron and, uh, I mean, many other things that you're mentioning can be pulled into systemd. Once that happens in the future, then uh, normally when there is a package, uh, uh, for example, we have seen it with KDE, uh, something, uh, a small component of it has a bug. And there's a lot of resistance to come out with a new bug fix for KD because it it, it changes uh, the bug fix has the versions have to be kept compatible against all the modules that are out there, and uh, there's a lot of resistance for coming up with a new version when a small component has a bug bug fix. I, I mean, I, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but you can update systemd and, and it's not that big. Like if you have a bug, then update systemd. That's totally fine. But the thing is, like I, I think actually that that um, updating things like this is much easier because. You, you get the test matrix down. You just apply the patch to systemd build, and you don't have to test um, this package against all the other various packages. I mean, most of the distributions allow you, allow you to mix and match not only different implementations of things, but also different versions of things. So you can run basically um, um, system5 in it against any kind of libc and these kind of things. But uh, basically, I don't think that's much of an issue because the package is not that large, and it's completely up to the distribution how they package it. So exactly nothing changes um, from the previous thing. Um, I hope that makes sense. I mean, right now in Fedora, we uh, system needs to split up into four packages or something like that. But there's probably plans to add a fifth or something like that. I think Debian splits it up in more, but it's really up to the distributions how, how much they do. But I mean, the other thing is like, one should not assume that cron is actually a lot of code. I mean, what you just think about what cron does. It, it, it actually executes something based on time that is not really um, rocket science. So um, they, they actually, like when I added calendar support to, to, to systemd, calendar time support, like calendar-based events, this was like, I don't know, 200 lines of code for, for parsing calendar specifications, and that's kind of it. Um, that is nothing. That is really nothing. So um, yeah, there's a surface where, 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 where bugs can be gets slower through system, uh, smaller through system D because you have so much less um, 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 duplication because because we now use all, all just one code pass for spawning things and then have a little bit that's just time handling instead of having the code pass for, for spawning things in, in cron and at and in INIT and so on and so on. Hope this kind of answers it. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> Linux has traditionally been uh, loosely coupled subsystems, which you alluded to as, you know, the bazaar model. So, and, and you said that, you know, there are advantages, and I see some of them in moving m more of them, you know, in a single, let's say, uh, atomic unit. But what are the disadvantages you see with that? Because, especially when it fits in the distribution model or, you know, about the lifetime of those packages, which are probably also being worked on in parallel by different groups. Honestly, I mean, um, people see different, like, like of course, um, one of the disadvantages of, of, of moving everything together is, is compatibility, because it, it does work differently than, than, than Cron did before. And we try to, to deal with these issues by saying, well, if you need to compatibility with Cron, then install Cron. That's what I meant with this, this non-exclusivity, that people can just continue to use what they want. Um, but uh, um, basically, um, yeah, it is about compatibility is the problem, then, then Doing things new, of course, always comes with with um, like a learning curve. Like people um, know how things used to be, and now they are slightly different. Um, that 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 is a problem, absolutely. I don't think it's a big problem because we really try hard to make systemd as easy to use as possible. But um, 
Um, yeah, I don't know. There, there, there are other drawbacks, of course. I think the net result, though, is that, that integrating these things um, has drastic advantages because it simplifies the code, um, unifies the code, and reduces the task matrix radically, um, and then these kind of things. So, uh, yeah. How do you, uh, what's the biggest advantage you're saying so to move to systemd? Because one day I move to systemd, I don't have cron, uh, say syslog works before I, I mean syslog is older than me, it works well, cron works well. So you're, it's a basically a big move, right? To enable like syslog, it was just one line of configuration somewhere. To enable journal CTS, it was like one huge command, like system CTLs or journal at something. How do you plan to move all the people to systemd? because it's anyways a very new thing. Almost all the commands change, configuration change, and what's the biggest advantage you're saying to use this and throw away everything <coughs> you know? Um, I, I don't know, the thing is like, I don't really try to move people to systemd necessarily. It's, I'm, I'm, like, this is, whenever we add something, we say this is the offer you have, but continue to use cron if you want to. Um, so uh, to convince people to actually use this stuff uh, is basically just by providing very good documentation and pro providing a lot of functionality that didn't exist before. For example, in the cron case, um, we will probably publish, publicize a little bit more that we kind of can replace cron these days um, by, by pointing people to, to new features that we can do in systemd that cron can't do. And there's a lot of things to that. For example, um, we want to add to cron that you can, can specify um, uh, um, things that you start even if the machine is off and then we, we use these wake up timers where the hardware actually, actually boots up and then can, can, so they basically have, have timers that can unsuspend and then start the machine if you want. And then for, for the cloud people we want to add some things that implicitly to, to every time event you can add a, add a configurable jitter so that if you have a cloud like a, like a, like a, like a cluster of machines that all start at, at the same time and, and um, yeah, not all the not all the, the cron jobs are run at the very same time and clogs the network at the same, very same time so that you avoid the DOS thing a little bit. And um, so, so if we add this jitter, which is relatively easy to add, then this suddenly becomes interesting to, 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 to cloud people. And there's a lot of things like that, that where, where we can, like for example, we can integrate anacron and these kind of things that where, and already actually the systemd uh, cron replacement language is a lot more powerful than cron itself is in, in very specific cases, for example, in, 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 in the system you can express, I want to start something on the first, second, or third day of the month if it is a Tuesday or something like that, which you cannot actually express in cron. And in the system you can express, I want to start something on that very specific date and actually specify the year for it, and you can't do that in cron. So um, all these things are mostly smaller things, but um, I think we can, can make this interesting for people by just saying, yeah, if you use that systemd builder and stuff, you get something that is drastically more powerful than cron used to be. And then there's lots of other things to that, like, like, like systemd is actually more, more power efficient in this way, because the way traditionally, yeah, I think I should totally just finish. But um, yeah, the, the thing how, how cron traditionally used to work is, is it woke up every, every now and then, figured out if there was anything to run, executed if there was, if it didn't, it would go to sleep. So it would do this definitely every minute. Um, now, uh, in, in systemd, we never do that. We actually wake up when we actually have to wake up. We just program the timers. Now, waking up every minute by itself is not expensive because a minute is like, you would never notice that in the power graph. But it suddenly starts to matter if you, if you multiply your machines, if you have containerized machines, if you run 500 machines in one, and every, every single um, container wakes up every minute or so, then this basically means you wake up more, more, more than once a second at the machi machine all the time. And um, in the container set up, yeah, and if you have this in the cluster, the same thing happens. So basically, um, yeah, we are more power efficient, we have a lot of things. So it's, uh, we, we, we try to, to make this attractive to people by saying we have more features. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a matter of, of telling people that. But I'm way over time, I think. And uh, so thank you very much, and uh, I have a good lunch. And uh, yeah, I hope this was interesting, and gives a little bit of an idea what we're trying to do with System B and, and what our vision behind System Uh, just a uh, small announcement. If you all haven't heard of NH7 already, it's one of the best uh, indie music festivals in India. And they're having uh, a festival this 15th and 16th in Bangalore. And they're kind enough to give us a 10% discount. So please head to the, uh, the Foster Day install, which is on the right of the entrance. And we're also giving our delegate kits at the swag area. Uh, please don't forget.